Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DeFerio. I'm your host for the show. And uh, hello, I'm glad to have you along on the show. And of course, I would encourage you to subscribe to this uh, podcast, wherever you're listening to this podcast. If you love what we're doing and it's really been beneficial to you, please leave a five-star rating or review and share these episodes. It's really helpful to uh, let people know that Keys to the Shop is uh, available as a podcast with over 900 published episodes available for the coffee shop community and industry worldwide. So thank you very much. And you know, uh, not only do I spend my time you know, producing these podcasts, but I also spend a lot of time working one-on-one with coffee shop owners and operators and their teams. If you're looking for a coach or a consultant to help you increase the effectiveness of your operations, the quality of your coffee and your service and hospitality, and just help you to uh, bring your cafe uh, and cafe experience to the next level, more profitability, uh, better hospitality, just more excellence overall. These are a lot of things that I work with my clients on on a, a weekly basis over the last uh, six or seven years now of officially like leaning into Keys to the Shop consulting. Uh, we've been able to work with over 65 different companies on projects that are both large and small. So if you're interested in working with Keys to the Shop consulting, just email chris at keys to the shop.com. We're uh, looking to onboard new clients in 2025, and that might be you and maybe we're the right fit for one another, but let's just have a conversation to see, okay? So uh, email chris at keys to the shop.com. Today's sponsor is the Ground Control Brewer and the Pacific Barista Series. Both of these companies are amazing. You know, the Ground Control Brewer has been making waves in the industry for quite a while at groundcontrol.coffee, and the Pacific Barista Series is the cornerstone of plant-based beverages and is preferred by many around the world at pacificfoodservice.com. You can find more information, but we'll talk a little bit more about them later in the episode. But right now, I want to jump into this conversation. Our interview today is with the 2024 Turkish Brewers' Cup champion, Nita Fetulaholo. And Nita is a wonderful professional who has a great story that she is going to get to tell us uh, about her professional development, competition experience, and you're going to see a lot of really cool insights that Nita has made as a result of uh, all of the experiences that she's had in her coffee journey. She's been in the coffee industry since 2017. She's located in the Turkish capital, Ankara, and has been living there for about 10 years now. Uh, before coffee, she w- studied English translation and interpretation in college. She did that for a bit. She did it for a while uh, and just needed a change. And coffee became a full-time job in 2018. And uh, she still dabbles in the world of translation. And remember this idea of translation because it's going to come into play later in the episode as we talk about coffee. She's actually translated four books into Turkish on, on different subjects. So that's pretty cool. Starting as a barista in a boutique coffee shop in Ankara, she fell in love with the great people, the coffee uh, industry, and just pursued it as a career and has been roasting since 2020 and for the last two years as a full-time roaster. She's currently working in Tetra and Roastery as a junior roaster. And this year has become the Brewers' Cup champion for Turkey, placing 18th in the world championships. This is something that is obviously very impressive. But when you hear this conversation with Nita and get to know how she uh, synthesizes her experience in the her other career in translation and uh, with the experiences in coffee and what she has to say about how she has learned wisdom and intuition and vulnerability and how to you know work through challenges from barista to roasting the competition and it's really going to be inspiring and so i was really grateful to get the opportunity to interview Nita on the show. And I think today's episode is going to give you a lot to think about. In fact, I would say at key moments in this podcast, I would encourage you just maybe pause it and just 
meditate on that idea that Nita puts out there because it really, uh, several intervals is gonna be some pretty deep stuff that I think could really help encourage you and direct the course of your career in a positive way. So without anything else from me, let's get right to it. Here now is my conversation with the 2024 Turkish Brewers Cup champion, Nita Fetulaholo. Hey, Nita, welcome to Keys to the Shop. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. It's good to be here. How are you? Oh, I'm great. Yeah, it's like fall here in the eastern U.S., so doing well. Um, you're all the way out there in Turkey, huh? Yes. Yeah, I'm across the ocean. It's also fall here, too, so that's nice. <laughs> oh, nice. I am thrilled to get to sit down with you and talk to you. I met you at SCA at the Etkin Brewer booth. Uh, fine folks over there, um, a Turkish porcelain brewer. Got a couple in my house. Um, shout out to Edkin. But yeah, it was great to meet you there and then you know learn about your story as you are a champion. You are the Turkish uh, Brewers Cup champion and a longtime coffee professional. So I uh, want to really just kind of start by asking you, the beginning question of how did you start to choose coffee as a career or maybe even just mm -hmm. how was it a part of your life even before you started to make it a uh, a professional pursuit yeah uh so like before i make this as my profession as my career of course like i consume coffee and i always have this specific taste regarding that department like i always knew what i liked but i wasn't like into it like as a hobby but me starting the barista as a coffee person in the industry started as uh, I was having a hard time in college <laughs> in terms of money. And uh, I actually, uh, I was actually like studying at the same time and I was doing that job. I studied translation and interpreting in college and I worked as a translator for a long time. But uh, then I realized that maybe that's not the thing for me. And it was uh, such a huge mental load. So maybe I thought it was time for a change. I started as a barista in a little coffee shop in Ankara, which is the capital of Turkey. Everyone thinks that it's Istanbul, but it's not. It's Ankara. <laughs> uh, I started as a barista, and then I was lucky enough to have amazing co-workers who would like, like teach me about coffee. And then after some research, of course, getting caught up in your podcast that's that happened then <laughs> my first year as a barista and then I started maybe I thought like I can do this as a job and I took some SCA courses and then I got into roasting real bad and then I moved on to another workplace where I can learn about more roasting and like my whole career pretty much uh like moved forward in the same theme. Like, what can I learn? What can I do like differently? Uh, what can I get for myself to like move myself forward? So that's what I did. Wow, I didn't know that you did roasting as well. I it sounds like you got a lot of experience pretty quickly. Uh, yeah, actually, you know what? Like, yeah, that happened pretty quickly. I worked as a, like a barista like a few years. After that, I moved on to like another roastery, but it was a, like a coffee shop at the same time. But like I moved up, I learned about some roasting and like actually I was a barista and a roaster at the same time for a long time, actually. And uh, only like uh, two years ago, one and a half years ago, I got a job in, in another roastery in Ankara. And that was my first time as a full time uh, roaster, like no bar shifts, nothing just roasting full time and um yeah it's tough it's it's brutal but i like it <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna ask it's uh one thing to do it a little bit part-time uh but then doing it full-time must be a big difference a big change of of pace so big yeah it was hard to get used to it at first but like at the same time i was like really into it and i was kind of sick of bar shift i was like bored <laughs> I'm sorry, like, <laughs> uh, I'm not, I'm not into bar shifts. Like, it's fun, uh, and like uh, getting interactions and you know working as a team. I love that. 
uh, that's actually one thing I miss as a roaster because roasting is a very solo gig, you know, and it's not glamorous. It's not as glamorous as being a barista in a bar. And I miss the camaraderie for sure. But like roasting is just, you know, it's endless and like there are always something to learn. But in a bar shift, sometimes it gets to be really monotonous, like, you know, um, really boring. Uh, and like the, this is my experience, my opinion, but it's the same coffee, sometimes same customers every day. And it, it gets really, I felt stuck for a long time, but with roasting and like uh, being in that production process really helped me as a professional too. And it really changed my perspective uh, towards the whole industry. So yeah, I'm not really, uh, I'm not uh, actually like people doesn't know I roast as well most of the time because I have this group. Uh, but like I, I do roast and I roast a lot, like six days a week. <laughs> wow. Okay. So can I ask a little bit about what you, you just mentioned how it changed your perspective on the industry. It, 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 on, on coffee, it, what specifically changed as you took on roasting? Uh, actually, like uh, I had a more in-depth knowledge about coffee because like, mm. of course, I'm always interested in coffee, like in terms of like academic as well. I love to study about coffee, like pen and paper. I have some article in front of me and reading about maybe brewing, about water, about varieties. I love that. But when you move on to the production side, you have to be more um, more like on contact. You have to know these in order to produce that thing, you know. And uh, like and like as a barista, I used to give a lot of crap to roasters too. So that's my karma happening <laughs> to me. You used to always blame the roaster? Yeah, yeah. I, I was one of those who always blames the roaster, but now as a roaster <laughs> I understand that. Well then you you have this how things work perspective on coffee and your journey through different jobs is no doubt changing the way you personally pursue you know, things professionally, like you, you're getting used to just being in coffee professionally from being a student to then, uh, a, a, in general to a translation to now translating that to being a student of coffee. Um, do you find, did you find that you personally changed in very many ways, um, because of having to interact with a variety of personalities in a coffee shop or, personal organization and that kind of thing exactly i mean uh i realized that now i realize that like i worked in different positions in coffee industry like i worked in a whole different career as well and i was able to like adapt to all of them at like to some extent uh i realized that like if you have to be good at something you have to have at you know something in your personality like as a roaster, like one thing I have to say, like I need to have this trait in my personality like as a roaster, that would be intuition and focus. Uh, I realized about myself while I was working as a roaster, while I started as a you know roaster, because like I, I'm in front of the computer, I'm looking at the screen, I'm listening, I'm smelling, like I'm using everything at the same time, like multitasking, multitasking actually, that's something I learned from my interpreting days because like someone is talking and I have to translate at the same time. That's multitasking. As a roaster, I learned about focus and intuition. Being a barista, that's just, I think that's the most difficult job in you know? like everything that I've ever done because you have to be like, you're, you're always like touching people. Like you're in contact with people, with conversation and like with feelings and with words. So uh like everything like in combined of course it's uh it all adds up to me as a person but like every job i take like no matter how different they are i always learn about i always learn something about myself mm. yeah that that makes a lot of sense and you know we're big fans of the idea that your vocation is kind of a journey of identity you know, in a lot of ways, you bring yourself to work. And I like that you brought up intuition, which a lot of people believe intuition is simply a matter of, of synthesized experience, like just wisdom, you know, that now, as if you look at a coffee today, 
having the experience you have, your intuition is based on all of the experience that you had making mistakes as a barista, making mistakes as a roaster and addressing those mistakes. Um, what would you say are the, have been the biggest challenges for you in the retail and in the roasting, uh, epics, epochs <laughs> of your uh, career? Biggest challenge. Okay. Um, so as for roasting, consistency is a big problem. <laughs> That's a, that that was a challenge for me uh, because, like I said, like I roast like six days a week, and like the most important thing I can have is consistency. Like that's a lot of coffee, that's a lot of roasting, a lot of batches. So I have to be consistent. consistent. So uh, my first challenge as a roaster was always, and sometimes it still is. Uh, but as a barista, I would say, I mean, people, <laughs> people <laughs> in general <laughs> is a the challenge. I'm not a I'm not a people person. I have to tell you, like I do it. Uh, like I'm not like I'm not a grumpy person. Like it's my job, and I have to be like sometimes like smiley and sincere and friendly at the same time. But sometimes it's just so difficult. And uh, as a barista. I often used to let other people, you know, put me down. Like sometimes a customer comes in and like it's just your whole day is just over and you get upset. And my biggest mistake was there. Like I get that upset feelings and I took them home with me like Ooh, yeah. all day, every day. Yeah, that was the biggest mistake and challenge for me to put that all behind at work. When I leave my ship, it's all just there. And you know nothing comes home with me. It's just me. That that was a uh, that was a difficult thing for me. <laughs> wow, that's that's very that's a huge lesson to learn because when you're passionate about something, you allow a lot of your emotions and you get vulnerable with it too. I mean, be working in coffee, like I love coffee. I love the story of coffee. I love, you know, that I can see myself growing as a professional. And then when somebody insults you or something goes wrong, it's hard not to get those very personal uh, depths of your being hurt along the way because you're giving yourself to the work. Um, but it sounds like you've learned how to become resilient and compartmentalize a little bit exactly i had to i mean i had to in order to survive because that was my job I mean, yeah i do that like 10 hours a day <laughs> so i have to i had to find a way to survive and i actually thought of another thing like a challenge as a roaster criticisms you know <laughs> because like uh, roasting can be uh, open to interpretation you know and you uh, you, you you know you roast something maybe like it's for the first time I profile some okay some coffee and the next day we put it on the table and we have our you know quality check process and we like tasted the coffee and then and then like everything is wrong like you while roasting you think that you did everything right and it's not yeah. even a, that difficult <laughs> of a coffee you know it's not geisha it's not pink bourbon it's just you know it's just some washed Colombian I don't know. Uh, but it's like you think that you did everything right, but on the table, it's just oh my god, it's the worst. And you cannot sell it, you cannot put it in a you know package and send it to a customer. No, it's just you know it goes away. And sometimes it's really hard to you know, take that hit. Uh, you know, uh, and the worst part is you don't know where you did wrong, so you have to pull up the profiles and you just have to analyze it over and over again. You know, trying to find the mistake. Sometimes then there is no answer. Like the next day you roast again and, you know, it's fine. The next day it's fine. That was another challenge for me because I don't know the reason. What went wrong? And yeah, that was another thing. <laughs> but when you get it right, it's the most rewarding thing ever. Like you roast the coffee and the next day you cup it. And it's beautiful. It's the most rewarding thing ever. That's why I love it. <laughs> When, when I see these on, on YouTube or, or our Instagram where p the game where you put your hand in a box, but you don't know what's in it and yeah. it, it's something really nothing. It's like a potato, but you think it's a monster or something like gross because you can't see it. It feels way scarier than it actually is. And you talking about how now the next day, if you haven't been able to track down that, maybe it was an airflow issue or maybe it was, 
you know, a charge temperature issue. Uh, if you don't know what it was, you, you have to enter into that black box of, am I going to do it again? Am I going mm -hmm. to roast another? <laughs> have, to. <laughs> have like lots of those. You have to roast them. <laughs> yeah. You're going to go back. <laughs> So that's, I mean, it's brave, I suppose, to, to do something like that and to, it almost feels like the, the game here is to close the gap between those really good moments of cupping. It's like to, yeah. to make everything, so it might be high, low, high, low in extremes when you first learn and to start to make everything sort of similar in you know, achievement. Like I know I'm gonna hit a really good coffee every time maybe a little bit better the next time but not so much worse the next time yeah. and you know, as much as you do that now i suppose you you're probably at that level at this point i mean it's it changes you know uh it's not a like a linear process it goes like everywhere yeah and uh actually roasting is really this is not like discovering and whole new content this is nothing new but like roasting is really similar to brewing in terms of like principles. So uh, in roasting, we have like color changes. We have like taste development stuff. Also we have in the brewing, we have like extraction, you know, you start brewing coffee and water comes in contact and you keep brewing and you have to know where to stop, right? Because at some point it's gonna be bitter it's gonna be like over extra you have to know where to stop it, in roasting it's the same you have to know where to stop but of course a lot more complicated because you have like uh, a thousand things happening at the same time but yeah I, I think it's important to you know make these kind of connections you know like when I realized this like oh roasting and brewing oh they're kind of actually similar like they have like uh same principles actually like this opened my world i think it's important to you know discover these kind of connections they're not like novelties of course they exist but discovering them on your own it's actually really rewarding it's very affirming of the fact that what you've learned in one area is applicable to something else that's consequential uh, to coffee it's it's i can see how, when you can make that connection, how it would energize you and also help you succeed in both of those disciplines, yeah. which kind of leads me to the idea of your competition career, because as a Brewers Cup champion, I'm guessing that this factored into how you approached your routine. I mean, how did competition in brewing start for you? Uh, was it around the time that you started roasting coffee kind of earlier in your career? Uh, actually, yeah. My first time, I've, I've been roasting since 2020, you know, on and off, off and on again, you know, because it was during the pandemic and stuff. But my first competition was actually two years ago in 2022. Uh, I did, it, did not have a, you know, good thing going on. I came like, I don't know, 16th out of 20, something like that. <laughs> it wasn't good. Uh, but the, I learned a lot, for sure. Uh, and like when I had the chance two years later, like this year, I got the chance. Actually, this year, I wasn't even going to compete. You know, that happened like really fast, really quickly. I wasn't going to compete because uh, actually like this year as a team in the roastery, we sat down and decided that we're not going to do competition this year because it's a lot of effort. It's a lot of time and money. We're not going to do it. We're, we're already busy as it is. So we're just going to focus on our business. But uh, in Turkey, usually they do these competitions in Istanbul. Okay. That's an important, important information. But this year, they announced that they're going to do the Barista and Brewers Cup in Ankara. That's my city. And that got me really excited <laughs> because they're also kind of a, there always been a beef between baristas from Istanbul and baristas from Ankara, you know. <laughs> I don't Ooh. know if you have this kind of thing. It's not like competition, but we have like different approaches in terms of customer service for one. But uh, I thought maybe like, Maybe a champion from Ankara. That would be nice. I got that idea. And I texted my uh, senior uh, at job 
had the head roster. I'm a junior roster. We, uh, we are two. Actually, we were two. Anyway, uh, I texted him saying that maybe we should do this. Like, they're going to do it in Ankara. And, and, you know, it's our city. Let's do this. And he completely ignored me. He was in Istanbul at the time. And in some, you know, random coffee shop, they actually, he ran into Michael. They knew each other from another competition. Yeah. So they were like talking and I, you know, he's actually uh, saw my text and, you know, he said to Michael, like, my friend wants to compete and maybe we can do something with Etkin Drupal, etc. And then it happened. <laughs> That's like how I decided to compete. You know, I wow. got really excited because it was going to happen in Ankara. Uh, you know, and like as a barista uh, located in Ankara, I'm really proud of that. <laughs> Being a champion in Ankara, <laughs> that's really cool. Of course, that's of course, yeah. in Turkey, by the way. <laughs> well, congratulations, of course. And um, what was it that was the biggest difference for you between the 16th place finish that you did in 2022 and your championship routine? Team, one word, team. Team. That's that's it. I had no team back then, and this time around, of course, like I, I I did some things too. You know, I improved myself. You know, I got some you know uh, knowledge thing going on. I got my courses. You know, uh, I improved myself, etc. But team, this is not like no matter what competition it is, this is not something that I could do on my own. This is something this is not something anyone can do on their own you know that's it the biggest mm. difference is definitely the team someone who gives you an opinion a different opinion than your own and of course you have to be able to listen to them. hey everyone it's chris again and we'll be right back with our interview with our friend nita but i wanted to talk to you a little bit more about our sponsors today of course the ground control brewer at groundscontrol.coffee has been for years now elevating the standard of batch brew coffee for baristas and coffee shops before the ground control with its SCA award-winning technology batch brew was kind of limited this has opened up the floodgates I guess of flavor and given you control over this broad spectrum of flavor you could pull from coffee uh, but not only is this a next level batch brewer but the ground control also can make batch espresso and cold brew so it makes it kind of an all-in-one machine the new brewer it is 30 percent higher output of those extracts but it's also smaller in footprint so best of both worlds uh, look into groundcontrol.coffee for this brewer and see if this is the right fit for you. If you want to elevate your quality and um, have an all-in-one brewer that helps you with efficiency, this might be for you. Again, at groundcontrol.coffee. Also, today's episode is brought to us by Pacific Food Services Barista Series, plant-based beverages, the plant-based performance beverages that Pacific produces under the Barista Series name has been the standard for quality plant-based beverages in the industry since forever. They also have set the standard and continue to lead the pack in how a company can support a community, an industry, and individuals. And they've been doing this for decades. Go to pacificfoodservice.com and get samples of the barista series to try for yourself. It stands up to the heat from steaming, creates amazing texture for latte art, and it keeps the balance of the beverage focused on the coffee. So if you're interested in serving the best plant-based beverages to your customers, then check out the Barista Series from Pacific by visiting pacificfoodservice.com. All right, now let's get back to our conversation with Nida Fatulaholo, the Turkish Brewers' Cup champion of 2024. The idea that you have outside opinion coming in, you have to open yourself up to criticism. Yeah. Um, which you had just mentioned was really difficult to do, but you had become a part of your job as a roaster. Yeah. So, you know, you're cupping the coffees, but now, you know, people are critiquing the way that you move between your different, um, the, the pour overs and the, uh, the, during the time, how to best use your time and the taste of the coffee, the recipe, uh, that's, it's difficult because you're, you're you are a professional and you have some professional pride mm -hmm. and trusting somebody else's opinion even though you feel really strong how do you how do you just decide that you're going to open yourself up to that critique uh actually you have to pick your battles you know um so i had like i have like lots of people 
who gave me opinion. But I'm not saying this in a bad way. It was all positive. <laughs> but like my coaches, like I had a, I had one coach uh, specifically. He always told me that like I'm not gonna tell you what to do. I'm gonna tell you like what we can do, and if you feel comfortable with that, you can do it. But other than that, it's okay. He always told me that, and I'm, and I'm really grateful for that. So like it, you have to pick your battles sometimes. It's about like trust, you know, sometimes maybe it doesn't feel right at the moment, but you trust that person and you trust their experience. And you you have to be like, I don't know, like how this is going to work, but I trust you and I trust your gut. So I'm going to do this. But it's some other case, maybe like mm. someone is telling you, you know, what to do and you're like, no, I don't feel comfortable with that. Like my heart isn't set on that. So I'm going to do it this way. Like you have to be, I don't know, you have to like trust that person. But of course, there's always a, there's always a limit. Of course, you, yeah. you, you should never do something that you're not you know, comfortable. That's the line. That's the, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't violate your integrity yeah. or your values, but know the difference between like not everything is your values and exactly. not everything is integrity. Like you have to be open about it. Like you have to because uh, you have your own ideas. But like this is a competition. You need you need something new, maybe something like innovative. And like you never know, uh, you know, which idea is gonna come from like you know different direction. It can come from anywhere. So you have to be like open about it. But I was like pretty um. How can I say like secretive? No, not, that's not the word. But I was pretty meticulous uh, about the people I choose you know, to be on my side. Like I had oh. my team in my roastery, that's two. I had Michael and Aaron, that's four. And I had like some other person, which I like respect like dearly. He's also another icon for me in the industry in Turkey. So I had like, five people like I would just you know talk about but different stuff they all had their own uh you know expertise I would talk with my like head roaster about the recipe I would talk with Michael about the score sheets I would talk with Aaron about like what I wear or how I look <laughs> I would talk uh, about like my other uh about teacher about the you know the cooking scores maybe the you know tasting you know they all had their expertise and i would know what to ask them you know that's you know where the mentorship idea comes in i guess they were all like mentors to me at some point they yeah. they were like coaches like they, that's that's in that was in the book by the way the difference between a coach and a mentor they were my coaches in that period but like uh, when i look at my whole life like the progress of it they they were also like mentors at some point in different cases of my life yeah, and you're you're referring to the uh, Ruth Gotien book on mentorship. Yes, that, exactly. Yes, that's a good read. Go check it out. <laughs> yeah, go check it out. Yeah, she's great, and uh, that's a past episode on our uh, podcast, maybe like a month ago. Great episode. But <laughs> you, 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 when you're speaking about this, of course, on Keys to the Shop, you know the part of the Keys to the Shop is the shop, <laughs> and the the customer facing expression of coffee in general. Um, as you talk about team, I can't help but think if I replace the word competition with business, okay, it would still benefit from a team. Yes. Where you open yourself up to the critique from outside opinions to be open to it and not be defensive. And actually, you probably could improve your business <laughs> by having that. Yes, right. That's what I've been saying to all my ex-bosses. <laughs> <laughs> They don't listen ever. Like, be open to criticism. Like, let's just, you know, open communication, you know, yeah. let's just talk about it. how can we do better. This is an open conversation. Like, we can do it and we can be better, but no, they would not listen. Well, you can beat the, you can beat everybody to the punch if you're an owner listening to this by simply, if, if you were like, uh, going to compete and you heard, hey, uh, Nita said you need a team. Just get yourself a team. Get your, you know, get yourself. Yeah. Tap into that mentorship. <laughs>
and use people, you know, use their strengths in your advantage. There is, you know, not, it may, when I say use, yeah, that comes out maybe wrong, but, you know, you know what yeah. I mean. You know, every person has their strengths and in a business place, an owner, a, like a boss, whatever you call a CEO, should know, like, how to mobilize that, how to put those strengths in operation, you know. That's part of being a boss, I guess, I believe, I assume. And uh, they just they just don't listen. It's crazy. Yeah, it's hard. It's a hard slog. You know, there's a there's a lot of um, risk involved, and and uh, you know the best the best of us out there in the world of of any profession, I think, are the ones who have a sense of um, learned resiliency that allows people to give mm -hmm. us feedback that doesn't threaten our peace, um, but we are, we are able to sort that into categories of usefulness and not useful and, and that kind of thing. Um, so hopefully more of us get there than not, but, um, going back to your competition, uh, when you, uh, went up there to compete and you presented what from your, uh, past experiences in coffee, did you integrate into, um, what you actually did? and what you talked about. Okay, so in my routine, like in the competition, uh, so Brewer's Cup is kind of tricky. Um, it's different in a way that you have to put on a show, you know, there's a stage part of it. It's not like, for example, roasting, roast and you know, present your coffee, but in barista and brewers, you have to put on a show, you know, you have to talk about like what you're doing and you have to be consistent you're saying that you're saying that to the judges like you're gonna find strawberry and they're not finding the strawberry that's a problem so <laughs> uh what i integrated like consistency was the key part for me like if i ever gonna win this thing it's gonna be through consistency so i you know kind of worked that in in my routine like how i practice uh and like i was you know, okay, so I was kind of lucky because I work in a roastery and I was able to, you know, uh, create a really uh, good workspace for my practices. So it, it was all about consistency. Like, uh, like, like I said, that was the first challenge I faced as a roaster. And when I decided to compete, I, you know, realized that this is going to be another, you know, a monster that I have to slay consistently. I have to be consistent. In what I say and what I do, so yeah, that was the like my focus point in my routine. Like I have to be consistent. Also, um, like I said, there's a like a showmanship part. I also work that in too. Uh, you, you know, being a barista, like working in a bar, that's also another show. You know, another stage. So you're smiling. You're you know, you're trying to you know make people smile, but also you look sincere and friendly. Uh, that's another show to me. You know, that's another stage. So I just, you know, use that chart. <laughs> I used to use when I was doing the stuff. <laughs> well, I feel like that's part of what we do in representing the work of uh, what the value stream has already done in putting on a show. We we talk about authenticity. Um, so we live in both a world where we value the show and the performative. The, the the word performative often gets a bad rap because it is a performance. Yeah. It is a artificial environment of hospitality. If you go into a coffee shop and you, you get these things, competition is the same thing, but it, it's all in the cause of putting our best foot forward to represent the thing that will ultimately create more of a virtuous yeah. cycle in specialty coffee or just coffee in general, I guess. Um, how do you view right now and this kind of opens up to a broader question because you've been involved in lots of facets of the industry and in competition and retail and roasting right now in coffee as you you look to see what's developing what do you think is the next best thing for us to focus our energy on that would do the most good for for coffee some mm. stuff that we can do especially in like coffee shops and in roasteries this question has like two answers like for roasteries, I would say like I don't know the like the whole situation in the U.S. So I have to you know talk about my Turkey. I think what we should do, but like this is like a general rule, and I think everyone can apply it. As for roasteries, I think we should 
focus on more like sustainability and sensory. Sensory is like the key for everything, I believe. And also we have to be able to, you know, uh, you know I say like intuition, you know, guessing the right answers, intuition, you know, that's what it is, like guessing the right thing at the right time uh, when it's correct. So we have to have intuition and we have to be able to foresee the future at some point. And we should really use some of our energy to be more sustainable in our rock trees. Like this can be like in terms of like what we use as a material in our packages, or this can be like what we choose as a coffee, you know, in the farm, you know, from plantation, from, uh, you know, washing stations. And the other part, like as for uh, coffee shops, I would say, you know, like my mind always goes to that idea of a team, you know, we have to be able to uh, build a team. Like I see this like everyday coffee shops, like in Turkey, they open one day and then they go under the next day. And like, if, you know, it's the same story every day. It's not about money. They have money, mm. but they don't have tea. Like I ask someone like every day, a guy comes in like and he's talking about his dream of having a coffee shop and he does eventually it's good for him. but like it's his like next day the shop is gonna open and i ask him so who's gonna work who's the barista and he's like oh, we'll find someone no you're not gonna find someone <laughs> just find someone you you should have you should have find that someone yesterday <laughs> you need someone yesterday <laughs> so yeah that's like the main issue i think building a team really appreciating your team and listening and uh, that's what we should be focusing on today like we that was the thing yesterday it is the thing now and it's going to be the thing in the future because there is nothing to build if you don't have a team and the second thing is of course sustainability and uh, if you have a team of course you're going to be sustainable and you're going to sustain your business yeah yeah that's really easy <laughs> Those are two wonderfully uh, put things, like well said. And um, the team part is, yeah. If you if you do have that team, the sustainability is going to come up at some point as a uh, as a point of uh, concern. Especially the idea. I've heard this said. We did a sustainability series years ago. That what somebody said, the best thing that you can do as a roastery or as a retailer is sell more coffee, and you know, stay open. Stay, you know, if you stay open and you sell more coffee, then what is grown can be sold at your shop. See, see, pretty simple, right? Duh. I mean, that's what you know we're trying to do. Sure. It's true, but you know how? <laughs> exactly, and and it comes from that that team aspect that you uh, focused in on. Um, and you know, speaking of the idea of we all operate in different cultural contexts, and um, there are lots of different opportunities for us, you know, maybe here in the South or elsewhere in the U S or the world, there is, here's our cultural understanding of coffee. And here's this newer thing, maybe, a, a, a new to that culture. And in Turkey, of course, with Turkish coffee, there is it probably the most, the, like the, it is the oldest way of making coffee. And I'm, yeah. you know, in your experience, it, I'm sure that there's been a lot of movement on this. What has it been like to be a spokesperson for specialty coffee in the midst of such an ingrained coffee culture? What works best for you to bridge the gap between current cultural understandings of coffee and successfully integrating new understandings of coffee? Um, you know, it, it all goes through communication, you know. So Turkish coffee, you know, that way of brewing coffee is all this time but like uh specialty coffee in turkey is actually pretty new like when i went to chicago that's what i realized i mean in the u.s you have like a good 20 years 25 years before you okay but like in turkey we have like a fresh decade you know <laughs> so of course like at some point turkish coffee that you know traditional way of making coffee met with specialty coffee and you know the result is wonderful and i remember actually uh, he was one of your guests tunjai yildiz one of the first uh turkish coffee champions and you know he was a guest on the show too he met yeah, yeah. yeah years ago he mentioned this as well like 
uh, the natural thing uh, to happen, you know, you know, you have this old way of thinking, old way of doing things, and you have this new thing, and you combine them, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna create waves, it's gonna create other new doors for people to, you know, peek in, and that's what happened in Turkey. Of course, we're like, I believe we have uh, still a long way to go, but in terms of like specialty coffee and Turkish coffee, they're like best friends. And actually, in like in terms of like competitions too, Jezve Brick Turkey is really good because in this year's competition, uh, Kevsa Ratmaja, another great colleague from Turkey, she uh, won the second place prize in Jezve Brick Championship in uh, Copenhagen. So it's all good, right. but like, how do we like translate this new thing to the people? You know, for example, like my parents. They love coffee because of me, because, you know, like I do this for a while and, you know, they hold, they have their whole setup, V60s, you know, lots of gadgets, <laughs> grinders, like everything. But like, what about yeah, the yeah. others? What, what about their friends? You know, they still like, you know, that old way of drinking coffee. And, you know, this is where the coffee shop comes in. If I can serve, you know, a coffee to my parents in that coffee shop, then that doesn't mean anything, you know? I think that's one of the problems, you know, the coffee shop doesn't know how to translate this new information to the old people, old way of people, you know what I mean? Uh, I think uh, we have to really, you know, fill that gap with the bridge uh, and, you know, and to the, you know, other people. And we have we, we shouldn't be intimidated intimidated by a new thing like this is a cultural thing of course but us Turkish people we're not really open to change we really love our old way of doing things so when a new thing comes in we are like most of the time we're suspicious like we, we don't trust mm. it so we have to as coffee shops we have to find new ways to introduce these things to the people like like older generation, you know, I like in my coffee shop, I want to be able to serve a cup of coffee to my grandma. If she's not interested, you know, why do I do this? <laughs> Doesn't mean anything. Yeah, yeah. So it's a communication problem. Very, yeah, well said. And it feels like if you can win over somebody who is in love with their current way of doing things and get them to love this way, their energy is going to just have such an exponentially huge uh, impact on that thing. But it's harder to get them to, you know, get that, share that love with the the new way. But it exactly. worth worth the pursuit. And you're a translation expert. I mean, you're, you, this was your field of study. So I love that you're talking about how to translate this to that generation. So based on the principle of what you need to do intuition, like you're listening, but you're having to think about the next thing to say, to convey the emotion of the speaker, but also the accuracy of it. How, I mean, how does that work? Like, what's the principle we could use from translation work in language to translation of coffee ideas? Oh, I love this question. <laughs> I love it. Okay. Uh, so actually, you don't know, remember the time like uh, 15 minutes ago, I said roasting and brewing, they're like really similar in principle. Yeah. So translation and coffee are the same. Coffee is also a, this whole journey of translation. We translate coffee constantly. I mean, why do we roast the coffee? To make it consumable because it's not consumable when it's green. So we have to translate, you know, and why do we translate it differently? Because every coffee is special, like different varieties, different processes. So we have to be really attuned and careful about doing the right kind of translation that is roasting. And then after roasting, we have to do, again, a form of translation, brewing. We have to be able to understand that coffee about you know, its characteristics, about its potential. And we have to find the best way to translate that, you know, bag of beans into a beautiful cup of coffee. This whole coffee thing is a translation. That's one of the, like, the main things I realized when I first started this job. And I was, like, in love instantly. So I love this question. And I have thought about it, like, for years. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's so helpful what you just said. 
And I would encourage everybody to think of this, just play it back and imagine, just visualize the kind of things that Nita is talking about here. I mean, you really are, um, when you observe what you, you do with your hands with the coffee and how people enjoy it, you're taking in this information all the time, right? And your your mind is going to come up with innovative ways to make it more effective for people to enjoy and for you to be more consistent like you were talking about. I mean, uh, and uh, everybody loves coffee, you know. You know, there is you know, nothing like there is nothing to misunderstand. Everybody loves coffee. If we're not trying to make people love something they do, they do not. No, they already do, but we're just trying to show something different. You know, some you know, different perspective, mm-hmm. another interpretation, another translation. I mean, why not? If that person is open enough to try it. That's a win. They don't even have to like it. You know, just try it. And that's a win for me. Excellent. Excellent. Nita, uh, no doubt we could continue talking quite a bit about coffee. Endlessly fascinating. Yeah. Um, but I really appreciate you being here to uh, open up our understanding of the connections that coffee has in roasting and brewing and translation and you know, your, your professional development story is uh, really inspiring. So, um, thank you. And, and how can we stay in tune with, with you? I mean, are, you know, we can follow you on social media. How would, how would we just get connected? Uh, yeah. So I have Instagram, uh, I'm, my social media game is not good, but you can always DM me. It's, uh, Senitfe, S-E-N-I-F-D-E. Yeah. Or you can just put my name on and because I don't think anyone's going to have the same name. So you're good. You're going to find me. You can always shoot a message. And I mean, this, this this was amazing, Chris. Thank you so much. This is another dream uh, coming true for me. And thank you so much. This was great. Oh, honored to talk to you. It was so fun. Uh, and thank you again, Nita. Oh, thank you so much. All right, everybody. Well, what did you think? <laughs> and let me know. I mean, I ask these questions. They might seem rhetorical, but I really want to know what you think about these episodes. I thought that this was a really cool episode and had, like I mentioned in the beginning, several points, the idea of translation, the idea of team, the idea of just being able to be vulnerable and open and overcome challenges by developing intuition. There's so many things that Nita has learned in her career that has been shared that I think w- if you apply these to your own career, it's going to help guide you. And that was just a, a ton of great value and wisdom that Nita shared. So huge thank you to Nita for being on the show. In the show notes, you can find links where you can find out more about her work. You can find a link to her performance at the Worlds and at the uh, Turkish Brewers Cup Championship. You can find uh, also her social media. You can also, in the show notes, find links to related episodes. We talk about things related to the topics brought up in today's episode. So I always recommend you go and follow that little logic train, I suppose, that you know my recommended episodes usually are going to be pretty directly related to things like, for instance, team or um, how to communicate well or navigating challenges in your career or even just translating the cultural understanding of coffee in countries where you know there's you know a, a set culture of coffee to specialty coffee and so forth so check that out in the show notes and if you have any questions about today's episode always feel free to reach out to me chris at keys to the shop.com that's just c-h-r-i-s at keys to the shop.com and if you are interested in working with keys to the shop consulting that's also where you can reach out now one of the places that you can also find some great resources is over at coffeefest.com 30 plus years coffee fest has been putting on a trade show slash education and resource event that's the way i refer to it because it's not just hey, let's show up and talk to some great vendors and learn about what products are you know, current and can help our coffee bar. That's a huge part of it. But it's also, let's come together and do some fun competitions. Let's have some panel discussions and lectures and trainings and workshops, many of which are free 
and or really reasonably priced, but deliver really outsized value for what you're paying to, to do it. It remains probably the best event for you to attend if you're looking for just street level, practical, applicable resource for your business. And I, I will stand by that. <laughs> Having been in this industry for like 25 years now, I could safely say there's a huge value here. So check them out at coffeefest.com. Lots of shows coming up in the new year. And I hope to see you there as well. Remember, go to coffeefest.com. And with that, that is the end of our episode, sadly. And also hopefully, because there'll be another episode where we get to join one another on, in the airwaves and talk about coffee, talk about leadership and management and career, and just build a better world of coffee for the people who enjoy it, who work in it. And I appreciate all of you. I really do. And if you subscribe to the show, you'll always be updated. Don't forget uh, we're on YouTube, all the podcast channels, share the show. And as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you keys to the shop. <laughs>